inshallah, uh, if Amirza, if I guess we're giving you the floor. And if Amirza, by the way, is um, is he authored the book, uh, the history of Bosnia and Herzegovina? It's like it's like almost like a textbook, I think. Um, and uh, we, we we thank him and we send him our gratitude because he kind of uh, decided to and agreed to do this on such short notice. He was actually informed of this yesterday. And may Allah bless him, and you know we send our sincere, you know, thanks and appreciation for, for you know, giving you, giving us your time. May Allah reward you. Please, if you can take it away. And obviously, guys, this is standard halakha procedure. Whenever you guys have a question, raise your hand. We'll get the mic over to you, and inshallah, you can ask the question as, as soon as you'd like. Thank you. Zakhla khair, brother. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Okay. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa Salatu Wa Salam. Um, dear brothers, sisters, thank you so much for, for inviting me and for, for um, opening the doors to your, uh, to your center so that we can have this important conversation. Um, there's a lot going on in Bosnia, as you all have sort of been watching the media, certainly from back home. Um, but we now need to sort of think about the realities of where we are. We are in a very comfortable space in America, alhamdulillah, despite everything that's going on with COVID and Omicron and all of the um, trials and tribulations the world is seeing. We, um, we are not in danger of, um, of being eradicated from the surface of the planet because of who we are in this country. Um, in Bosnia, um, that's not the case. In Bosnia, they are facing a very real threat. And, um, and it's important for everyone, Bosnian or not Bosnian otherwise, to understand that threat because it's a pervasive threat. It's a threat that we've seen in history from time and again, um, not just the time of the Holocaust, from well before that, going all the way back into Bosnia's earliest recorded history, we see the same pattern um, of threats against uh, a very small population that's holding up what I would call probably the only moral compass in Europe today. So um, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and why Bosnia and Bosnians um, are that moral compass for all of Europe and what that burden of responsibility means on them. Um, and then we also want to talk a little bit about identity this group in particular, a lot of you, all of you, I assume, are all children of parents from Bosnia Herzegovina. You're descendants of that. And there's some interesting facts about your history that I uncovered um, during my research that surprised a lot of people. And every time I talk about it, um, they always do a double take and say, wait, did you just say that? Um, yeah, I did. And then they say, well, where's your you know, proof? And where did you, how did you figure that out? And so on. And so um, so as you know, many of you know, you probably have heard or seen, I wrote this book called The History of Bosnia Herzegovina. And um, it was a labor of love. It was four years of intensive research. There's some 500 references in the book. I think I read probably more than 15,000 pages of texts, um, PhD dissertations, analysis, essays, articles, journals, things that people had written to get to this, you know, 380 pages, I think, or something like that in this book. Um, it's kind of a textbook. It's written like a textbook. I originally started writing it like a, a book for, um, to explain a little bit about Bosnia. And then um, what I found is I couldn't explain a little bit without explaining um, what happened previously. And pre prior to that, and prior to that, and of course, curiosity got the best of me, and so I, um, I said instead of me continuously chasing sort of the backwards timeline or chronology of Bosnia, let me go to Bosnia and think of how I would write the book differently. A chronology didn't seem to make sense, although history is a series of events that unfold in a chronological order. So. I went to Bosnia and I tried to sort of triangulate where I thought was the center of the country. I physically did this. This was um, years ago before Corona and all of that. And I went to Bosnia and I sat um, in the center 
what I thought was Bosnia and Herzegovina, close enough, many places that probably would be the center. And I sat on the ground. I went and actually sat in the field, like farm field in um, uh, Visoko. And, um, and I sat, I asked the farmer for permis permission and he said, okay. So I went there and he said, what are you doing? He says, are you meditating? I said, no, I'm sitting here because I want to see what the world looks like from within Bosnia. And he was surprised. He said, you can't see much of the world. You can only see my farm. You can see the hills. I said, yeah, but there's a philosophical idea here. The idea is, what does the world look like if these hills weren't there, if the mountains weren't there, if the world wasn't sort of the, the um, kugla, the, the sphere that it is today? What if it was flat and I could see all the way to the edges of every country, every region, every ocean, every continent? What would I see? He said, well, you would just see geography. And I said, let's also interlace into that the idea of time going past in my lifetime, that I can rewind history as far back as I want and I can wind it forward. So that led to coffee at his house and, um, and, and, and a conversation. And he's a farmer, he's not a highly educated man but he has relatively infinite wisdom compared to what, what I know, because he knows a lot about Bosnia. So, so we sat and we, um, we had a conversation and he said, why is it so important for you to look at the world and its history from Bosnia? He says, so many history books have been written and there are so many history books about Bosnia. And I said, it's important for me because I think I'm making one differentiating factor in this history book that others haven't made which is all the books and articles and journals that I've read about Bosnia, most of them, pretty much 95% of them or some very high percentage, all look at Bosnia from the outside. So when the Byzantine wrote about Bosnia, they wrote from Constantinople. When the Romans wrote about Bosnia, they sat in Rome and they wrote about Bosnia. When Noel Malcolm wrote The Short History of Bosnia, it's a phenomenal book. He wrote it from the UK, looking down south at Bosnia from the UK. When the scholars in Beograd wrote all the history content, Geografska Kartika and all those books um, about Bosnia, um, they sat in Belgrade and they looked at Bosnia. It made me wonder at what point Will somebody sit in Bosnia and look out at the world? What would the world look like? Would it be different? And much to everyone's surprise, it's read the book so far that, um, uh, that I've talked about the book to, it is different. They, they are all, um, they're all surprised at what, um, what the book reveals and the perspective that it takes, okay? So we'll pause here a little bit because now you understand why this sort of idea of looking at Bosnia's history from within Bosnia and then looking at outside events from within Bosnia is a differentiating factor in how I did my research. Okay? It, was, um, it was with the intent, the really genuine intent of understanding what was Croatia like when Bosnia was first formed? What was Serbia like? And the goal was to understand Bosnia's two gravest threats today and to understand its largest and most significant neighbors and partners, okay, which happened to be Croatia and Serbia. I wanted to look at Rome from within Bosnia because I had enough of reading about Bosnia from the Roman perspective and so on and so on. And of course, as history unraveled backwards for me, um, starting with uh, the present era, going back to the war of the 1990s, the genocidal war, before that, um, through Tito's administration, before that, through the formation of the Yugoslavia, um, the Socialist Federated Republic of Yugoslavia, the Second World War, and back to the First World War and so on. I just started going backwards and backwards and backwards 
because um, it was compelled to sort of answer the question, well, what was there before? And what was there before that? And what was there before that? We went all the way back to the Ice Age because that was the only way that I could explain the Bosnian people is to go back to the very roots of the people to say, where did they come from? Now, we don't have history books or texts that take you back that far, but we do have genetic science, right? So I overlaid genetic science. We do have anthropology. I overlaid anthropology onto history. We have archeology span in Bosnia. I went to so many sites, dug up old archives and records of the archeologists, their notes. And um, I overlaid that on top of my understanding and explanation of history. So the Chronicle started becoming stronger and stronger, not just with historical thought, but also with science from genetic science, with anthropology, the movement, movement of people over time, especially in the early days, from archeology, span the findings of the artifacts, the early villages that they had dug up in Bosnia. Um, from looking at, um, at geology, the earth science itself, the mineral deposits that are in Bosnia, um, looking at how those deposits were formed during the Ice Age, and when and where in the Ice Age um, uh, um, people started coming to Bosnia. So there were a lot of different opportunities to reinforce our understanding of what we think is historical chronological context with all of these other uh, disciplines. And so that basically became a project, as I said earlier, four years in the making. And, um, and I found quite a few things that I think you're all gonna find interesting. So I said earlier, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about format. I want to keep this as discussion, not a lecture because I don't have a whole lot of um, prepared content Ordinarily, I would like show you slides and pictures of my trips to Bosnia and all the cool things that I did and all the snakes that crossed my path along the way on my journeys to all these villages and remote places. Um, but since this is Zoom and going on, I want to keep this a relatively free form discussion. Um, and we'll try to answer uh, as many of your questions as possible. You know, people said earlier and you know that I'm an expert and so on. I have some knowledge. I think expert perhaps is too too strong a word. I have some knowledge of Bosnia. I certainly have a thesis about Bosnia and I can defend Am I muted? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, as, uh, uh, and I've defended my, my, my thesis a number of times um, in very scholarly forums. And um, uh, I, think, I think the record speaks for itself as to how, how the thesis holds. So I, I have a thesis, I have an understanding, um, and I also have a, um, an opinion. And I'll try to make a differentiation today as I speak between what I believe, that's my opinion, what the thesis says, which I think is corroborated by 500 references to other scholarly works, um, and it's in the book, and then um, uh, and then what I think is is common myth, what people mythologically believe, but probably is not true. Okay, so let's have a conversation that revolves around that, um, and I think with young people when I speak, and especially in English, because while my Bosnian, while everybody praises me on my Bosnian, I think they're just tolerant of it. Um, uh, I think I'm a much stronger presenter and speaker in English than I am in any other language, um, especially when it comes to the topic of Bosnia, because I, I, um, I researched in English. I converted and translated everything that I found from Latin and Greek and uh, ancient languages even into and, and Bosanchica and Bosnian um, into English. I, I went back to the sources and I tried to understand certainly all those that were written in Croatian, Bosnian, and Serbian, all of those languages. I went back to the original sources and I read them both in English, the translated version, and then back in those languages again 
um, meaning three times the amount of effort with every paragraph that was written that I needed for my book, um, because I wanted to make sure I not only understood sort of the literal meaning, but also the meaning in between uh, the phrases and the lines and the intents of the authors, um, because I didn't want to misrepresent anything. This was genuinely, I think, a work of honest scholarship for me. And, and I found so many things that, um, uh, that many of the scholars now are looking back at and trying to claim um, as, as their own findings. And I'm okay with that because my idea was not to have some sort of intellectual ownership or proprietorship over what I found. This is Bosnia's history. This history belongs to each of you, your ancestors, um, your families, uh, your neighbors and friends, and um, uh, far be it for me to claim ownership of any of it. But it's interesting because scholars in Zagreb started adopting the very ideas um, about genetic science and started trying to include those into their historical research. We see the ideas of anthropology now being um, very vigorously debated was put into test. So some of these ideas are actually growing um, uh, in the area and people are very interested in them. Okay, so let's pause there and let's talk about, um, did you understand what I was saying so far about how the book got created and the, the, the thinking and the method that went into it? Yes. Okay, I'll take that as a yes from everybody. Anybody have questions at this point? How long? Just ask him quickly. How long did it take to make the book? Oh, it's a good Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? I think you probably can. Uh, you're fine. Can you hear us? You're on mute. He's muted. Yeah, I think he was actually moved. I don't know how his connection is. We can't hear you, Ms. Okay, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. No, we can, yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, I think, did somebody have a question or a comment? I didn't hear it. It was too far in the background. Yeah, I had a question. Do you want? Hello? Go ahead, I can hear you. Um, I had a question. So after you started from the center of Bosnia, where, how did you figure out where to go after that? Like what made, what influenced your decisions on where to travel, how, where to look? Um, okay, so the question is after sort of sitting in Lisako and trying to sort of triangulate the center of Bosnia, what did I do? I went to a lot of different places um, to, to see what the world would look like from there and, and, and you know, take on the perspective of, of a, a journeyman who's looking back out. Like as an example, when I mean looking out at the world, let me explain. Um, when you read about Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, um, most of the text revolves around Bethlehem. It revolves around the Galilee, it revolves around Palestine. Um, where Isa alayhi salam was born. It has a very Roman or Western centric view. Um, images of, of uh, Isa are white man-ish. Um, I decided to look at the birth of Isa alayhi salam from Bosnia. Why not? 
Bosnia was there at the time that Jesus was born by any calculation of his birth date. Um, and it's a different perspective than the one you get when you look at the birth of Jesus from Rome. Because what you see um, Jesus being born in the Galilee is that Jesus is born in a tribe known as the Pharisees of, of the many tribes, Jewish tribes that, um, that were in the region. And, um, and we see that for about 30 years of his mission, um, Jesus leaves an exemplary, he saw this one, leaves an exemplary life. Um, and um, in that exemplary life, there's no mention or structure of church. And I'll come to your question as to where I went next with this. I think it's a problem with his internet connection. For example. Oh. Are, are, am I yeah, you broke up? up a little bit. I don't know if it's a problem with our internet connection or yours. I don't know if we're hosting this Zoom. Um, I have tested at 168 download and 16 megabits or something like that upload. Okay. Um, we keep trying. I think we're good now. We can hear you well. Yeah, we can hear you well. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering if our internet connections are all now being run by like the old um, um, Europe, Eastern European telecoms, you know, where you have to buy those little cats that say with impulses, with every word that you say, tick, 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 the impulses go. And next thing you know, next you have to go back to Posta and you have to pay more money. And then they put more impulses on your card and then you go back and you start, right? That's just a joke, okay. Um, so, so I started looking at, at um, how did Bosnia see the formation of um, the Christian churches? And it's a different perspective than the one you see when you look at it from Rome's point of view. Okay. Um, the Roman perspective is that um, Jesus is to be declared as you know the Father and the Son uh, and the Spirit all in one, one purpose, in one, one body, in one frame. Um, this wasn't the case when I did the research in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Right. From Bosnia, they didn't get all of the messages, all of the, the, the information that was being imparted from, uh, at the time, uh, Byzantium, um, the towns of Nicaea, uh, Izmir, that's in modern day Turkey, where a lot of these decisions were being made, or Alexandria, Egypt, where, um, the church synods were first being held. In Bosnia, what I found is the second place I went after Visoko was a place called Yaitse. I think a lot of you have probably visited the town. If you're not from there, I highly encourage you to go and visit it. In Yaitse, they have, um, they have a, 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 in the center of town or close to the center, they have this um, uh, old uh, uh, hidden church. It's buried underground. And um, when you ask the locals, what is it? They say, well, you know, the museum says that this was a, a place where some saintly person was buried and, um, uh, and it's just a mausoleum. But when you go into the church, you find that it's more than a mausoleum. It actually has pews. It has a place where early Christians used to sit and kneel. That's how they used to pray. It has an altar. And um, the church doesn't date back to Jesus' time. The church is much nearer than that, but it's nonetheless a hidden church. And so my question was, if this is a church, why is it hidden? Well, as it turns out, Christianity was illegal. It was banned for the first 300 years after Isa alayhi salam, right? It was, a, it was an act of Constantine um, it's called the, uh, the Edict of Milan that legalized Christianity. Up to that point, anybody that was a Christian had to be hiding. They would be killed if they, if they exposed themselves. 
And so in Bosnia, we find a much later relic, an archaeological find, an artifact that says, hey, Bosnians used to have to hide their churches. And it only makes sense because Christianity was a banned religion. But here's an interesting thing. This church wasn't made at the time of Christianity being banned in 284, 285. It was made much later than that. This is actually a place where Tito um, uh, formed his very early ideas of the Partizani and of uh, how he was going to defend Bosnia and Herzegovina during the Second World War. He took refuge in this church, this mausoleum. So that question led to an interesting investigation and discovery. The church in Bosnia was hiding itself from the Pope. Subhanallah. How is that even a thing? Well, don't forget, Bosnia was considered a heretic kingdom for 1100 years by Rome. And by today's definition of what Bosnia was back then, Bosnia was actually a Protestant church before Martin Luther. Perhaps Bosnians are the first Protestants in Christianity. Right? So history from a different perspective reveals a different analysis. And it begs a different set of questions than the ones that we had. From my perspective, and maybe from a Muslim perspective, the church in Bosnia becomes a really interesting idea for me. Because I was always taught as a Muslim that there's this idea of people of the book. Right? We consider the Torah and the Injil, the, the book of the Jews and the book of the Christians, the gospel, to be holy books. And the people who adhere to those books and um, embrace those faiths, those people are considered people of the book. So by some extrapolation, the early Christians in Bosnia were of that faith. They were actually the people of the book. And Bosnia didn't um, buy into the notion of the Roman church. And by about the 12th century, it brought about a series of crusades against Bosnia that in some philosophical sense continue to today. So Bosnia's history becomes really important in trying to understand what's happening today. Why is Bosnia struggling so much to get into the European Union? Why is NATO membership for this country that's at the, at the, 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 the fulcrum of so much activity in Europe? Um, why is NATO membership such a challenge for Bosnia? Well, a lot of it has to do with the political ideology, not of Bosnia, but of the rest of Europe and what the rest of Europe knows and thinks about Bosnia. So this history became um, very, very significant in explaining and trying to understand what it is that we should be thinking about today in terms of our approach um, to Bosnia from the Western perspective and also from Bosnia's approach back to Europe. Until, I believe, and this is my opinion, until these concerns and this, this difference of, of um, factual uh, uh, awareness is resolved, until that's resolved, I don't believe Bosnia is going to reach any sort of a, a, a successful existence in Europe, um, economic, political, um, or otherwise. So that's how I started my journey around Bosnia. And I went to all parts of Bosnia. I went to uh, Eastern and Western and Northern. I went to Pasavina. I went to Ukraina. I went to Herzegovina. I went down south all the way, um, as far south as you can go in Bosnia. I went to Dubrovnik, it used to be known as the town of Ragusa. And um, I started talking to scholars and people there. I went to Istria. 
um, along the northern edges of Croatia because I wanted to understand uh, Bosnia's history from the time of the Illyr people um, that had populated that region very early. So all of this became, um, uh, I want to say, a, an exercise. But I also chose archaeological sites to visit. Right? I went to Stolitz. I went to this this cave. It's called Pechina Badnia, and it's um, it's a lot runs along the the river Bregava. It's sort of now a, a stream. Maybe it's dried up mostly. Um, but at the time of the Ice Age, this was actually a refuge for Europe. And the very earliest Europeans that we have in recorded um, history, as well as in, uh, sorry, that we have in anthropology of the modern humans, not of the Neanderthals, but what we used to call Cro-Magnon man, anatomically modern human beings. Um, some of the earliest rec or records and findings in archeology span of these humans and genetic sciences traces them back to this place in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There was a village along the Bregava River um, that dates back to about 12,000 years ago. So what we call um, the Mesolithic time, meaning after the Paleolithic time, uh, sorry, the Neolithic time, meaning after Paleolithic and Mesolithic, in the Neolithic era, about 12,000 years ago, uh, villages were formed in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That made me ask, where did these people come from? Well, as it turns out, they were running away from the Ice Age because the Ice Age happened about 16,000 years ago and, um, and it lasted quite a long time. And the Ice Age, um, don't forget, wasn't like a snowstorm. You guys have snow in New York? Yeah, yes, it's yes. not like a snowstorm yeah. in New York. It's not like the worst snowstorm you had. The worst snowstorm you've ever had in the history of New York, that the recorded history of New York, altogether is like an hour of the ice age. The ice age left kilometers of ice and snow over 75% of Europe. Like by kilometers, I mean, in some places as high as five kilometers of snow. Okay, just imagine three, three and a half miles of snow being piled up, like there's nothing, no trees, nothing, nothing, nothing. There's just snow and ice everywhere. And of course, anything that needed to survive that could, that could move, got up and moved. Animals instinctively went south as they dispersed there were many people who were smart enough to follow them. There was an animal known as a chamois. It's like a cross between a goat and a, and a deer. Um, and there were very large herds of these in Europe. Many of them fled west. They went towards the Pyrenees Mountains in France. Many of them went um, east. They went towards Ukraine um, and the Black Sea. Many went south towards Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the people that followed them were several tribes, we think. Um, but genetic science shows that there was one group that left um, around the area that's known as Moravia, which is around, in, around the Czech Republic today. Um, and they consisted of what we've identified today as Swedes, Scandinavian people largely, um, some Ukrainians, and most Bosnians. So if you ever think there's somebody in Sweden that kind of looks like you, might be a distant cousin of yours. Um, the group that ended up in Sweden actually went from Moravia and they went towards the Pyrenees. They um, ended up in the Basque territory um, between France and Spain along those mountains and they stayed there until um, the Ice Age receded, a couple of thousand years. And then, of course, as the Ice Age receded, these were people who obviously um, were explorers and they enjoyed um, the cold. They started following the receding ice and went all the way up to the Scandinavian countries. There was a group that went towards the Ukraine. They settled around the Black Sea and they stayed there. There was a group that came to Bosnia and Herzegovina and they stayed there. Groups migrated all over the place, 
Um, and genetic science is starting to unfold all of that. We look at this mitochondrial DNA, the mother's side of the DNA, and we start to see patterns among Bosnians. We look at the paternal DNA, the, and we see patterns along that side. Um, so we get a very clear understanding of where Bosnian people are coming from. And we also get a good understanding looking at archaeology of how long they've been there. And um, I read in articles from my former professor at uh, UCLA, Maria Gambutas, who was an archaeologist, and she went to Bosnia. She is one of the people that unearthed this Pechina Badnia and all of these caves and historical findings. Um, uh, she concluded that the villages in Bosnia in Neolithic time were trading with each other. They had political affiliation. They had social and cultural interaction. And they had economic dependence, codependency. In other words, 12,000 years ago, these villages in Bosnia were actually acting like a nation. They had security treaties between each other. And archaeology revealed all of this. The reason it revealed it is because we found um, spears and defensive shields, materials that made up defensive shields that were fabricated in one village, um, damaged and destroyed in battle in another village. And when you find that kind of artifact, you can come to very simple conclusions that when a village was attacked, the other villages sent their men to come to defense. When we look in the graveyards, what the remains are, where the, the, the dead are buried, you see they are buried in positions of honor, high up on hills. They are, the, many of them are seated when they are buried. Right? The enemy are all buried face down because we found remnants of skulls. The glorified war heroes are lying face up. There's so much to Bosnian history um, that um, I could probably spend a lifetime researching it and, and, um, and writing about it. So that's kind of how long-winded answer to your question. Sorry. More questions, comments? Uh, I actually have a question. You mentioned that the Roman uh, Empire considered the Bosnian kingdom a heret heretic kingdom. This was prior to the to the split between the Eastern and Western Roman empires? Like, and um, yeah, it was about that time that it happened. Okay, so around the 12th century. Um, oh, so let's start there. The cover of this book, do you guys know this bridge? Yes, I think. Okay. What? Is that the bridge that Mehmet Zukolo? Is that the bridge that Mehmet Zukolo Pasha made? Yes, it is. This is the bridge that Mehmet Pasha Zukolo made. Um, it's the bridge in uh, in uh, Visegrad, uh, and um, here's the thing: in Visegrad, the bridge has a history. It has eleven arches. Okay. And this is a question that so many Bosnians have gone over this bridge. Um, it's the bridge on the Drina River. Um, so many people have have traveled this bridge, but. I saw it and I asked, why 11 arches? Why not 12? Why not 10? What was it about the arches? Is it an engineering thing? Some arches are small, some are bigger. What was this all about? And here's what I found. For 11 centuries, Christianity was a unified religion. Okay, for 1100 years. But then it broke. There's a saying in Bosnian, and I can only say it in Bosnian because there's no equivalent of it in English. Christianstvo pukla na Drina. This means that Christianity shattered across the Drina River. And literally, the Drina became the divide between Western and Eastern uh, uh, Christianity. The Eastern Christianity became what we call today the Orthodoxy, and Western Christianity became what we call today Roman Catholicism. Do you have any maps right. available that you can present? Yeah, there's actually some maps in the book. I'm saying like, because I think Zoom Zoom gives you that option where you can serve as a presenter and share the screen. If yeah, I don't think I have any of that um, available in PowerPoint. 
um, or in a in a form that I could digitally that's, share. I didn't prepare for that. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Another time. Yeah. Um, but if you look at a map of Europe, Central Europe in particular, you will see how the Drina River runs and how it particularly um, forms the dividing line. And by some extension, just extrapolate with me here, Bosnia-Herzegovina becomes the buffer zone between Eastern and Western bodies of Christianity. And today, it continues to serve that purpose. Take a look at it. Who lives in Bosnia? Muslims, Bosniaks. Croats and Serbs. Orthodox. Croats and Serbs. Who lives in Serbia on the other side? Serbs. Serbs. Who lives in Croatia on the other side? Catholics. Bosnia is the demilitarized zone. It's a weird, weird twist on, on analysis. I tell Bosnians that and they look at me and they go, what are you talking about? I say, Why do you think you guys have been in the middle of all of these crises for so long? You have become the servers of Europe where Europe needs you to be that buffer between the East and the West. In 1991, all of the Serbs were ethnically cleansed from Croatia. All of the Croats were ethnically cleansed from all the Serbian places. Down south, their niche, Knin. In Bosnia, they were living together. This was the demilitarized zone between these two very powerful empires over a period of thousands of years of history. Bosnia served Europe's purpose of having a place where the refugees could go. It might not be a popular narrative to say that about the place. So that was a dramatic pause. <laughs> Explain what's happening with the neighbors of Boston. Can you guys hear me okay still? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. So yeah, so there's some interesting, interesting, um, and, and Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic, by the way, um, his intent to build something that would last the centuries, which the rich did, that would demonstrate that, hey, for 11 centuries, this was the place where Christianity was unified. And when it broke, he wanted people to know, to remember when Christianity broke apart and where it happened. So this was the mark. Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic, now that we're on the topic, was an incredibly smart and advanced man, way ahead of his time. Do you know, he built one of the first libraries in Europe. That library was built um, 35 years before the library at Oxford University was built. Before Oxford University had a library, Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic had a library in Bosnia. Before the Medici family, you know them, right? Um, built the library in the Vatican. 85 years, 85 years before that, Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic had a library in Sarajevo. His idea was an interesting one. Okay. His idea was that he wanted to bring so many books into the library that no single person could read them in a lifetime. People went crazy. What kind of an idea is that? Why would you want to have so many books that no single person could read them? Just think about it. Think about it from a historical point of view. What a radical idea. Up to that point, you wanted as many books as a person could read, so that way I could become knowledgeable. And then he instituted another thing. He, they said to him, well, how are people going to learn? He said, they're going to sit in a circle and they're going to have a discussion. Mm. This circle 
And this place that he had built for students is known as the Hanukkah. You can go to Sarajevo today and you can see it. It's there today. And the idea behind the Hanukkah was that people would sit, the students would sit, they would read their books. I would read the books that I could read, you would read the books you could read, and we would come and we would have what they call a rasprava. We would have a debate, we would have a discussion. You would impart to me your learnings and I would impart to me my learnings. Wow, did Mehmet Asha Sokolovich invent the democratization of education? I asked that question and it went all the way to Cornell University. Maybe he did was the answer. Professor Wales Bowles, Slavic studies. Sorry, Wales Brown. Um, maybe, um, maybe, um, maybe he did. So now it becomes interesting. Why was all this hidden? Like, why did it take me to go find this out? So many people know so much more about Mahmoud Tasha Zakolovich than I do for crying out loud. Well, it served a political interest, right? Over the years, the political interests were those of the rulers of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now they say that it's the victors in a war that write the, the history, not the vanquished and so on. Yeah, I get all of that. Um, it doesn't change the history. Right? So some interesting facts and some interesting things about Bosnia and about your heritage. Um, that like if somebody in my ancestry had done something like, hey, I invented the idea of libraries to the point that, that there would be so much content there that no single person could, you know, consume it. And that the way that they would, they would learn would be by having these discussions and debates. I mean, we're talking about the 12th century in the time, medieval times when, when, um, when 13th, 14th century, in medieval times when people were, were, were just in Europe um, fighting for survival, food, basic necessities, trying to understand what their rights were on this planet. How many of you know um, the Magna Carta? Right? King James created this document and blah, blah, blah. Well, 34 years before the Magna Carta, there was a guy in Bosnia by the name of Kulinban, Ban Kulinovic, of the Kulinban dynasty. Kulinban created a document. Three decades before King James started writing the Magna Carta, this document granted the people of Ragusa, which is today Dubrovnik, the country, the Republic of Ragusa, the right to trade freely in Bosnia Herzegovina. That's incredible. What is this? In medieval times, what kind of document is that? Well, it gives merchants the ability to come into Bosnia Herzegovina and trade, and it guarantees their safety from the government of Bosnia Herzegovina at the time of Bosnia, Kulinban's authority to protect them. And he agreed not to tax them. 800 years later, a bunch of Europeans sat in a town called Maastricht in the Netherlands in 1990 through 1992. And they debated and discussed the idea that there would be this free market economy so that traders from one country would be able to go to another country and trade their goods and they would enjoy the protection of the authority in the country where they were trading at and they wouldn't be taxed. I just have to ask, wasn't that Kulinban's idea? Like the idea of the European community, the idea of the European Union, the foundational components, economic components of the European Union, free trade, free transport of goods, tax-free protection of the authorities. Kulinban had it 800 years ago. That's what that Charter of Kulinban is all about. It's called Povile Kulinban. You can go see it in the museum. The original sits in St. Petersburg, but they have copies of it. So for me, this is all like, you know what? Um, history being looked at in a different perspective, 
causing me to go back and look at that charter and look at how was it written, who crafted it, what was going on, why did the Ragusans want to trade in Bosnia? Bosnia is a country of four million people. The Ragusans were seafarers. They could go in boats wherever they wanted to go. They were competing with the Venetians, the traders from Venice. They sat on the Adriatic Sea, their entire town, their entire country, their village, their republic. It's all one big port for crying out loud. Why did they want to go inland, these seafaring people? Well, you kind of have to sit in Bosnia to understand that. So let's go back to Bosnia and say, what was happening in other parts of the world at the time where the Ragusans were trading? Well, the Ragusans were phenomenal traders in a place called Jerusalem. And at the time, a man by the name of Salahuddin Ayyubi came and conquered Jerusalem. He blockaded all of the trade traffic from the Venetians and the Ragusans. The Ragusans Wait, had no place to go. Who are the Ragusans? The people of Dubrovnik no. from Ragusa. So the people of Dubrovnik were about to go bankrupt. They didn't have any place to trade. So Kulinban said, rather than having a neighboring republic that used to be a part of this territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina go bankrupt, why not give them an act of mercy and generosity? Generosity, what we call today Rahman, to allow them to trade here because their main trade routes through Aleppo, uh, through Jerusalem, to Damascus, to Baghdad, uh, all the way to Iran, all of those trade routes were completely blocked by Saladin Ayyubi. Right. So it's a really interesting um, connection point between what's happening in Jerusalem, its effect on Dubrovnik and Kulin Ban, coming up with this brilliant idea to increase economic interdependence, an idea that Tito, Tito later borrowed, by the way, when he formed the Socialist Federated Republic of Europe. An idea that Europe is trying to uh, embrace today. So there's a lot of interesting um, twists to understanding the history when you put it in this perspective of things that are happening in the world. Okay, more questions, thoughts? How are we doing on time? I just want to make sure we're okay. I think we're okay with time. Questions, guys? Let's go to this guy. You can hear me from here? Yeah, yeah. Speak up. Okay. Yeah, Salam alaikum. You can hear me fine, right? Yes, I can. Alaikum Salam. So, uh, when did the people of Bosnia, like geographically, become distinguished enough to call themselves Bosnian? That's a really good question. Um, when did the people become distinguished enough as a nation to call themselves Bosnia. Um, the idea of Bosnia, I think, truly was formed in the time of Kulin Ban. At the time, there were two rulers that were very powerful. King Henry of uh, Hungary, who was known as King Emmerich, um, and uh, Heraclius um, of the Byzantine Empire. And um, Bosnia was a, a territory, the fringe of the, of the um, Byzantine Empire, and it was ruled um, by, um, by King, King Heraclius. Heraclius sent um, an envoy, um, appointed sort of a, a duke or a deputy, if you want to call it, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, uh, his name was Borislav. And um, Borislav basically uh, um, um, tried to bring, uh, create an alliance um, with uh, the, the people of Serbia. And Heraclius took that quite disfavorably. He had given the Serbs territory to go live in because they had come to Byzantium um, as refugees. 200,000 Serbs were marching in the fifth century to um, a, uh, uh, um, a 
sorry, uh, were marching um, to Thessaloniki, which is um, it's in modern day Greece today. Um, and Heraclius was worried that he would either have to kill 200,000 people, which he wasn't sure his soldiers were ready to do, massively massacre them, or they would overrun his military posts. So Heraclius granted um, the Serbs some territory to go and live in, the territory that they had previously occupied on the other side of the Drina River, um, what's today modern day Serbia. And so Borislav was trying to create an alliance um, uh, with Serbia that Heraclius did not appreciate because he thought that it would make um, the, the, the Serb forces that much stronger. So Heraclius um, demoted um, uh, Borislav and, um, and came to power at the time Kulinban. There's not much known about how the Kulinovich family um, came to rule in Bosnia other than they were noble families. And Ban Kulin himself was a very respected statesman. He had relations with King Henry. He had relations with Heraclius. And what he was able to do was sort of negotiate a, an existence for Bosnia with a level of autonomy that allowed him to rule and to create a system of justice, like a judicial system in Bosnia, an economic system, um, and to have some level of political and military, uh, political freedom and military alliance that he could pull. The The strings on whenever you know well, at the time they didn't have nato they had reckless and byzantine and they had king henry and the hungarian empire and um and rome and so uh Kulinban was able to negotiate this so i would say bosnia was formed as an entity in the time of ban Kulinovich. it was a nation it was it acted and behaved like a nation well before then but the declaration of bosnia probably came at that time um as anybody. Certainly Kulin Ban um, had alliances, very strong alliances with the former rulers of Bosnia, but I don't think he had a, um, um, a dependence on them for autonomy. Okay. He was independent. And the reason this question becomes important, why is it important? Well, today, because Bosnia's very existence is in question. At some point in time, um, the, the question becomes absurd because America wasn't a country until 200 years ago, 230 years ago, whatever it is. So what does that mean? It shouldn't be a country today. It should be, a, it should be like uh, Canada was a country like three years after America. Does that mean Canada needs to be a part of America? I don't know. Arizona didn't become a state until 1912. What does that mean? I mean, doesn't th these things don't mean anything yet? They are the crux of the debate over Bosnia's existence. Like they shouldn't be. It's completely irrelevant. Bosnia seceded, according to modern rule of law. Right? The modern. Rural rule of Herzegovina called for a two-thirds majority. We don't know exactly how many people came out to vote because, um, uh, percentage-wise, because we don't know what the exact population of Bosnia was. Bosnia has seen its, seen its share of migrations. Bosnia was part of a federated socialist Yugoslavia. People lived all over the place. It was like you living in New York and me being in Arizona, and it doesn't make any difference. So, um, about two thirds of the people came out to vote. Ninety-six percent of them voted in favor of uh, of secession. Bosnia seceded. It was recognized. 
um, by neighboring countries, by countries in Europe. Um, Lisa, sorry, um, uh, Bulgaria being the first one. Um, and then subsequently, uh, United States of America, Great Britain, France, um, and the United Nations. By any definition today, Bosnia is a sovereign nation and it deserves its right to sovereignty and its people deserve the right not to be attacked in acts of war and aggression by their neighbors. In 1992, both Serbia and in 1993, Croatia violated, and Serbia and Montenegro, um, violated international law, sent their armies across the border of a sovereign nation, militarized the Serbs that were in Bosnia and Herzegovina, provided them with leadership, military leadership, political support, financial support, religious support of the churches, the churches, cheerleaded them, generated propaganda, prevented humanitarian support, prevented political and military intervention, in order to commit genocide. That's a pretty big condemnation on two neighbors. And Bosnia today has to live with those neighbors. Serbia and Croatia are Bosnia's two largest trading partners. It's no different than, um, than Ukraine and Crimea or Georgia. Russia is their late or largest trading partner. This is a pattern that's so common in Europe. So Bosnia has to now figure out how is it going to defend its sovereignty? How is it going to protect its people? After all of this that it has undergone from its closest neighbors committing genocide. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible position to be in. And today what we see happening is the fanning of the flames, the propaganda machine that committed genocide was never really dismantled. Yeah, Milosevic died and Tujman died and you know things happened. Um, people were convicted, found guilty, Radovan Karadzic found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica and um, Mladic and Krstic and all of these people, that's fine. Um, but the masses that it took to commit those atrocities, they haven't been brought to justice. The propaganda machine, the political machine that Serbia had and has today, the academic, the religious machinery, it's never been touched. The machinery that created the ideas and the propaganda that led to hundreds of thousands of people participating in committing genocide against their neighbors, even family members, um, that machinery still exists. And so today we become really concerned about Bosnia because that machinery was never dismantled. Dayton brought about an, a, an agreement, a peace agreement that says, hey, um, uh, let's stop fighting so that we can try to create um, a prosperous uh, economic um, and, and politically stable uh, nation in Bosnia and Herzegovina that has some notion of equity, equity in, in the running of the state among the, the three um, groups, um, religiously, different or types of people that live there. That's, that's really what it is. I don't know why religion is chosen as a means of identifying um, a, a class for, um, for what I would call an affirmative action, if that's how the framers of Dayton perceived it. But that's what they chose because that's what the propaganda machine sold. The Orthodox in Bosnia and Herzegovina weren't called the Orthodox, they were called Serbs. The Catholics in Bosnia weren't called Catholics, they were called Croats. 
I don't understand why that's the case because to me, a Croat would be somebody from Croatia, somebody who lives in Croatia, somebody who is of Croatian citizenship. All of a sudden, the word Croat became something, Hrvat became something more than, than what it is. Um, I want to tell you, I had given a copy of this book to uh, former President Haris Selajic. Um, he wrote the foreword to it because he liked the book so much. Um, after I gave him the first edition of it, he actually went to a meeting in Zagreb um, with the president of Croatia at the time. And um, they started talking about the history of Croats coming to Croatia. Um, Haris I just said, I don't know if you read this book, but um, I want to tell you when um, Bosnians saw the first Croats arriving on this coast, um, we welcomed you. We said, Dobro ste vi došli. So um, there's a, a very interesting, um, uh, contention as to who came there first. Um, historical archives, even recorded history, um, tells us very clearly that the Croatians came several hundred, several centuries, several hundred years after Bosnians had already settled in that area. The word Istria is not a Croatian word. It's not from the Croatian language. It's an Illyrian word. And um, Istria was the goddess of wind. Uh, sorry, it was the goddess of the sea in uh, Illyrian mythology. Bura was the goddess of wind. So if you go to Bosnia, um, in the town of Gorazde, just outside of the town of Gorazde, there's a, um, a very old, ancient, buried underground uh, temple. It's a Celtic um, type of temple. Uh, it actually uh, is what today we call in England the Druids. Um, they, had trans they, had, they had traveled through Bosnia and Herzegovina, and at some point in time, they had built a temple. And there is a, um, a, a, an artifact that was found in archaeology, a little statue of a, of a, of a woman um, known as Bogina Lug. Um, and so the goddess of Lug is what she's known as. And so they were they were worshippers of of um, statues and stones and things, and different gods and forces. Um, and um, uh, it was interesting because in history, um, historians have been trying to, and theologians also have been trying to understand the nature of God and how um, God has been predominantly a male figure. And we talk about God as He all the time, um, but yet in fact, in the in the pre-Celtic culture um, in this time of Bogina Luga, she was a woman. So somewhere between in the travels of this of this race of Druids um, and Celts from Bosnia Herzegovina through Bosnia Herzegovina, the figure of God changed from being a female to being a male. Right? And now you start seeing in Iliad mythology and past that the idea of God being a male. And so there's some really deep, deep um, uh, uh, events that happen in Bosnia and Herzegovina that even today have a reverberating effect on our lives and our thinking, our, our assumptions. How many of you um, uh, work on weekends? How many of you get like Saturday or Sunday off from work? Parents, maybe, a right? bunch of us. Why do we get Sunday off? Well, everybody says that that's the day that, you know, people go to church. And so that's why they've declared it as the day the Jews get Saturday off because that's their sort of religious day and Muslims take Friday off because that's their religion. That's all fine. But why Sunday? And what happened to cause the church to say, hey, this is a day that people should go to church. So if you go back in history, you go to a place um, uh, in, uh, in northeastern Bosnia, um, those towns known as Srebrenik and uh, Srebrenica. The word Srebro in Bosnia means silver. Um, in that area, in the time of the Roman Empire, the Romans used to mine for silver and gold and all the way to Moesia, which is in modern day Serbia. Um, and so they had, they had slave laborers that they had enslaved to go and mine uh, the silver mines and gold mines there. And 
um, the 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 um, the slaves were getting fed up with all of the mining that they had to do. So they started a revolt. And so the Roman commanders um, wrote to King Constantine, Caesar Constantine, saying that they need reinforcements of their garrisons because the uh, um, the slaves in these areas were, were revolting and um, not going to produce uh, the silver that Constantine needed to support this growing and bulging Roman Empire that was becoming very expensive to manage from the East and the West. So Constantine wrote back to the commander and said, if I send you soldiers, all they're going to do is kill the very laborers that I need to mine the silver. So I'm not going to do that. Why don't you instead give them a day of rest? So the Roman commanders gave the slaves, the laborers, a day of rest, which was Sunday. The church then came and said, great idea. All of you should be in church. And so Sunday became a day of rest for all those hard workers thanks to the miners and the laborers in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I, I get Sundays off work. I have to go back and thank all of those that revolted, that stood up against the most powerful empire on the planet, the Roman Empire in the time of Constantine, the most powerful. A handful of slaves and they were able to institute a change that has lasted centuries and benefited so many what a history what a rich history bosnia has oh my god the more i researched the more i found um the more the deeper i went into trying to learn more about the place each of you should be absolutely absolutely thrilled to know that, hey, it's your ancestors that brought about this um, this social evolution that we're living through today. We absolutely have to be grateful to them. Okay, are we on time? Nobody said that to me yet. Yeah, I think we got like uh, 15 more minutes. If you can, uh, I guess, focus the, the rest of the talk on more recent events, I guess, uh, starting with like Ali Azid Begovic and, and, you know, the seceding from, from Yugoslavia yeah, and all sure. that. And, and... Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit more about, about more recent events. So, as I said, in 1992, um, March of 1992, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, referendum declared independence um, and um, as soon as it did um, people came out on the streets um, and uh, marched for peace um, Serbia had already initiated a military campaign um, to disrupt the march for peace Milosevic had fomented a uh, tremendous amount of hatred. He had already built this dehumanization of uh, Bosnians and Bosniaks by calling them Turks and dependent and descendants of Turks and all sorts of um, rhetoric. It was no different than what the Nazis had done uh, uh, to the Jews um, during the Second World War, before the second start of the Second World War, uh, demonizing them and making them, um, uh, you know, seem like they were. Uh, um, people who were who were intent on destroying civilization and humanity and so on. So the same tactics, copycat tactics of the Nazis, um, uh, were brought in. And these, these copycat tactics, by the way, were also used by the Croats during the Second World War. Um, what was known as the independent um, uh, state of Croatia at the time, NDH, um, uh, they were allied with the Nazis in the Second World War. They were, by many descriptions, trying to be bigger Nazis than the Nazis themselves. So this region has a, a long history of knowing full well what the Nazis had done and how they had succeeded. Long story short, 
Um, Milosevic had fomented um, a tremendous amount of hatred and mobilized um, and financed military activity. Um, Alias Begovic was um, uh, the first president of Bosnia, modern day Bosnia Herzegovina, um, uh, duly elected and appointed and uh, sort of known as the father of the, of the nation. Um, but here's the thing, his presidency was completely, completely mired in a war from start to end. And um, he had to face the very difficult challenge of um, ensuring that his nation and his people survived. The idea of Bosnia-Herzegovina um, needed to live uh, for a number of reasons. The people of Bosnia-Herzegovina um, probably would not have survived um, had it not been um, for the tenacity of all of the people who were so instrumental in founding the nation, um, the modern nation, and in uh, protecting it and defending it. I was there from um, very early in 1992, um, all the way through for the next two years in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, crisscrossing front lines in many towns, um, figuring, trying to figure out uh, how to deliver humanitarian supplies, and medical supplies, and but also in the process of doing that, trying to understand the factions that were fighting, where they were coming from, how they were being financed, how they were being militarily supported. Um, and then to my shock, to see 36,000 international um, uh, uh, protection force members, civilian and military, 36,000. That's how many were in Bosnia and Herzegovina over the course of the war. And all of them, including me, witnessing genocide, all of us witnessing genocide um, and not doing anything about it. Years later, fast forward to 1995, um, President Bill Clinton was having a conversation with the President of France and the conversation is on July 13th, 1995, where the president of France is telling the president of the United States, they are separating boys and men from women and executing them in the fields. This information turned out in a memo that was released under the Freedom of Information Act by the Bill Clinton Presidential Library the memo is redacted, meaning it has blacked out lines in it. I have a copy of it in the book, um, where I believe the word genocide was blacked out because it says in the memo, um, these are the memo. Okay. Um, are, um, critical. Um, components, here we go, sorry. Critical sentences, two very important sentences, and I can read you what it says just before and after so you understand it, okay? So this is um, dated July 13th, 1995, Oval Office, Jacques Chirac from President Bill Clinton, and Anthony Lake is the, um, uh, sorry, uh, Alexander Versbaugh is the note taker, and um, uh, here's what it says. Uh, the fall of Srebrenica, the probable fall of Zepa tomorrow, and the real threat to Gorazde represent the major failure of the United Nations, NATO, and all the demo democracies. Sorry, I don't have my glasses. You see what we are seeing on TV, how the Serbs are separating men from women. This is President Chirac telling Bill Clinton on July 13th, sending women to be raped and killing men who are old enough to bear arms. Okay, the next part is redacted. And then it says, therefore, we must res uh, restore the situation to the way it was guaranteed by the UN. The 
nations are guaranteed it, right? That means restoring the situation in the Eastern enclave. So there's enough information about what happened during the war to be able to write a very clear narrative. There's no doubt about it. There are thousands of pages of corroborated testimony, testimony that's verified in The Hague during all of the trials, in all of the courts, international courts. All of that testimony, thousands and thousands of pages, thousands of news articles, news stories, video footage, all of it tells the story of the world. Sorry, did we lose you? No, 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 we're good. We can hear you. So, and what happened in the war was um, uh, an act against humanity. Um, the act was that of what journalists called ethnic cleansing, which is really the forced displacement of one half of the nation's population. More than 2 million people got kicked out of their homes, disenfranchised. 20 or 30,000 people ended up getting raped, including children and women. Um, torture, rampant, concentration camps. There's a, um, a, a piece in um, Richard Holbrook's book um, about Bill Clinton calling Anthony Lake the national security advisor and asking Lake after he read um, um, Roy uh, Gutman's article in New York, uh, uh, in New York Times um, that said, uh, and, and, and Bill Clinton asked Anthony Lake, are there concentration camps being set up in Europe today? And Anthony Lake said, yes. Um, concentration camps, um, 100,000 people killed in the war, um, all for the sake of uh, military pride, perhaps political pride, it's hard to say. Um, the atrocities, the genocide committed against the Bosnian people, non-Serbs being extricated, meaning kicked out of their homes, being killed, brutalized um, in places like Srebrenica, in Priador, um, uh, mass graves being set up. Uh, where thousands of the history uh, longer than the siege of Stalingrad during the Second World War. Um, just when you when you stop and you think about about what happened in the war. Um, a lot of your families um, came to America to find refuge here. Um, they didn't have a place, um, even among the hostile neighbors that had initially agreed to take refugees um, to stay there. No opportunities to return back home. But um, Bosnia prevailed after that memo and after a lot of pressure was applied. Um, during the war, I must say, at the start of the war, before the start of the war in Bosnia, the United Nations Security Council imposed an arms embargo because they were worried that um, uh, the war would escalate with more weapons um, being infused into the territory. So Bosnia and Herzegovina was prevented from um, getting weapons. All of the weapons or majority of them were controlled by the Serbs, the Yugoslav uh, People's Army, the JNA. They, um, they, uh, uh, they used those weapons the weapons that Bosnians had paid for with their taxes, the bullets that Bosnian workers had paid for with their taxes um, were used against Bosnians by the uh, Yugoslav forces and by their rebel compatriots who were the Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, clearly an act of aggression for a military power entering Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then in about 1993, the Croats, Croatians from Croatia under the leadership of Franjo Tuđman decided that they would also go and try to carve out a piece of Bosnia for themselves. So they started a war within a war. They wanted to create um, an entity within Bosnia and Herzegovina that would then become a part of Croatia. Croatia had expansionist ideas. All of this was found in um, international courts. Um, what was described by the international judges as a, um, an international criminal, uh, criminal uh, enterprise and that enterprise was formed between Milosevic and Tuđman, and victim of that enterprise, that criminal enterprise was Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Bosnia found itself in 1993 um, in a 
in an entrenched war with Serbia and with Serb forces occupied the country. Um, the only open front that it has was in the south towards Herzegovina. That front was then um, uh, occupied by, uh, by Croatian forces uh, from Croatia, Hrvatska, Vijeća uh, Odbrana uh, is what it was called, HBO. Um, they, um, uh, they turned out to be um, a, a force that betrayed uh, their loyalty to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Bosnia was facing an enemy in the front as well as an enemy in its back. Um, and they also committed atrocities. They set up concentration camps in southern Herzegovina, Gabela, um, Heliodrome, I mean, places that are, uh, have been written about in so many new art journals and so many news articles. And um, so Bosnia found itself in a very difficult situation. No opportunity to bring in weapons. Whatever weapons they had, they would have to steal or win from the Serbs. They had no opportunity for international support. Um, its finances were, were limited and locked. Um, there was a close U.S. Fifth Fleet was in the Adriatic Sea. Um, it kept a very close eye on everything that was coming and going. Um, NATO had imposed flight restrictions so that military planes from Serbia couldn't attack Bosnia. Um, but at the beginning of the war, they did. Uh, they caused enough damage to Bosnian infrastructure. So it was a lopsided war. And finally, in 1995, um, Bill Clinton um, were ordered uh, NATO to engage in activities in support of the Bosnian military that had uh, pushed Serbian forces back by that time under the leadership of a man by the name of General Atif Dudakovic. And, um, uh, and then with the help of NATO, um, we were able to push back Serb forces. Um, and uh, that brought Milosevic to a peace treaty and Tujman. And Milosevic and Tujman, as well as Alias and Begovic, were taken to the town of Dayton, Ohio, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base um, around Thanksgiving of 1995, November. And a peace treaty was uh, hammered out. That peace treaty is known as the Dayton Agreement or the Dayton Accords. It's the general framework for peace and security in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, that framework uh, has ever since the signing in 1995, um, agreement in Thanksgiving and then signing in December, um, that agreement sort of served as a constitution for Bosnia and Herzegovina when in fact it never was meant to be. And in that constitution, there are certain rights that are granted to these ethnic groups, the Serbs, the Croats, to the Bosniaks, and um, uh, and there are certain clauses that call for the sovereignty of Bosnia and Herzegovina for its territorial integrity um, not to be threatened. And yet, over time, we've seen dissident Serb forces fanned and flamed and supported economically um, as well as politically by Serbia and Russia. Uh, to sow um, the seeds of dissent in Bosnia and Herzegovina to threaten secession, meaning to break away uh, a, a territory from Bosnia and Herzegovina, almost half of it. Um, and we've seen a tremendous amount of disruptive activity from uh, Serbian leadership over the years, ever since the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed. So Bosnia today finds itself facing a number of challenges um, the challenge of discrimination uh, runs rampant in Bosnia. It was found in the International Court of Justice um, as something that violated European um, principles and also violated principles of Bosnia's own constitution. Um, this was found in a, in a decision known as Sejdic Finci. Um, Sejdic is a gypsy, uh, Roma descent. Uh, Finci is, Jakub Finci is a Jew. Um, they, if they ran for president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, would not be able to declare themselves either a Bosniak or a Serb or a, a Croat because they're neither Orthodox nor Catholic nor Muslim. And so, um, and um, Sejdic is in fact of a gypsy descent. And so the court found that the ruling of Bosnia and Herzegovina to have three presidencies, and in fact, the entire tripartite structure of Bosnia's government structure um, to be discriminatory. Bosnia has not had the means to enforce 
that uh, the findings of the court and to try to bring equity uh, to its nation because it means that they would have to reform the constitution, re-agree on Dayton, re-agree on what the principles of democracy need to be in that country. So we find um, in a subsequent uh, situation where Republika Srpska, one of the two entities, the smaller entity uh, of the two in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, declaring January 9th as a national holiday. In fact, this is a violation of the separation of church and state because January the 9th is a date when um, the uh, Slur Serbs um, celebrate um, a religious festival and the court found this to be in violation, uh, again, uh, in support of discrimination and violation of human rights. And this January 9th, a week ago, um, we found sadly um, militarism, 800 soldiers marching through Republika, parts of Republika Srpska, um, joined by the, the Prime Minister of Serbia, right? yet again an act of fanning the flames from across the border um, to threaten and intimidate survivors of genocide um, in those territories that have been given their rights, as Jacques uh, Chirac said in his in his conversation with Bill Clinton, to restore the rights of those people, um, it never really happened. While that was the intent of Dayton, um, the way that Dayton is playing out today is like a very badly written peace agreement that has outlived its time. So now the question comes, how does Bosnia Herzegovina protect itself, its people, all of its people, and how does it go forward? These are the challenges that Bosnian politicians are facing today. And I have only one um, piece of advice for them, not that any of them have ever asked me, which is read and understand your own history. Don't, don't go to my book, go wherever you want to go to, but understand your own history. And in the context of that history, plot for yourself what you think is going to be a course for your nation and your people in the future. Without looking back at what happened, you're never going to be able to um, plot for yourself a future that's free of those terrors that your people failed, the people saw and suffered them for this thing. It's getting late for you guys. I'm okay with time. I don't know how you are. We haven't uh, heard from any of the sisters in the group. Thank you so much, Irfan. That was very informative and very helpful. Uh, we can find your book on Amazon, right? Not yet. Um, we're we're in the process of publishing the third edition. Um, I don't have a commitment yet as to when it's coming out, but um, I'll certainly keep you all informed when, when we do have a uh, word on when it will be out. And um, it will be in both Bosnian and English languages. The book has been translated. It's in production. They're trying to figure out how to format it and so on at this point, but um, that's the plan. The third edition covers a lot more than the second edition did. And um, it has more about the present and you know, sort of the contemporary issues that you're asking about. So, um, so I, was, I was honored to be able to research that and also include it in the book. Thank you, thank you. But look, any... Bosnia's history, you don't need the book. You just need to go there. You can go to any town in Bosnia. You can go to Kluc. You can go sit on top of this, this uh, uh, Toran that they have there. Um, and um, and uh, it's, it's the place where um, uh, Stepan um, Tomasevic took, uh, took refuge. Um, and you can look down, you can go to, uh, to Visoko and you can go to the town where um, so many of Bosnia's kings, it's called Arnautovic, Mili Arnautovic, um, where so many kings were crowned. The altar and part of the temple is still there. The seat of authority of Bosnia um, is still there. You can go almost any place in Bosnia and you will see these sarcophaguses, the, what they call stechak, um, these tombstones that honor the dead and they tell incredible stories um, of fealty, meaning loyalty to the nation, loyalty to God. Um, you can research and study about any of Bosnia's rulers. There's so much to be said about them and uh, so much information that's available. It's a very, very rich history. All of you um, have such a strong sense of identity that you can associate yourself with. That identity is being threatened today. Um, there's an attempt in the final phase of genocide to erode 
including any mention of Bosnia, the Bosnian language, Bosnian name, the word itself, Bosnia, being removed from so many towns. Um, your identity itself is at risk. And I would encourage each of you to go back and, you know, um, re-embrace it. It's yours if you don't protect it. Um, I don't believe my book will be enough to, uh, to save it. Uh, thank you. Any, any? I think we have time for one question. Okay, no question. Is it, Can we hear from the sisters? I didn't hear any questions from the sisters. What was the King of Yugoslavia doing during the Crusades? I just slid in. <laughs> so uh, I just just have one like quick. Was there a reason that out of all the uh, territories that the Ottomans conquered? Or, or expanded into? Is there a reason that the Bosnians specifically accepted Islam uh, so quickly, or, or were, the, were the only people that accepted? Um, is there, yeah, this goes back to the time of Bogomil, right? So Bogomil was a Bulgarian um, priest. He had uh, traveled with his followers to Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Bogomil were actually followers of um, Isa alayhi salam's very early teachings. They were not part of um, the church as it um, uh, as it became incarnated in uh, in the centuries after Isa alayhi salam. They were ascetics, meaning they didn't believe in wealth or value. Um, uh, and um, uh, we don't know a lot about them. What we do know is that they had principles that were very similar to what um, Islam teaches. And so when um, when the Khazars first came to the Khaganate in uh, in um, Belarus and those areas where the Turkic tribes had originally traveled, the Arabic tribes, uh, the Ghassanids, um, they, those dynasties of early Muslims um, actually influenced a lot of the, the thinking of the Bulgars and, um, and certainly of Bogomil. And when that message reached uh, the Bogomili in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it was very easy for them to embrace Islam because the principles were so similar of charity um, the belief in one God, um, the unity of God, um, uh, the, um, the, the concept of uh, messengers and um, Isa alayhi salam being a messenger of God, not of being God himself. Um, so these ideas um, became very, very popular uh, with the Bosnian population very early on and those traditions and cultures stayed. You can read all of the, um, the children's stories that evolved from the time of the elite all the way through to, um, uh, to, uh, to modern times. And you'll see that the, a lot of these traditional uh, ideas and traditions um, have, been, have been propagated or stayed sustained in society. So when the Turks came and they presented the ideas of Islam through their dealings and through their um, to their offerings. Um, and don't forget, the Turks made Bosnia and Herzegovina an investment. And they, they introduced the idea of investing in Bosnia by building infrastructure, by educating, by, and yes, they, they, um, they got lots of benefit out of it back also. Um, they were able to settle Jews at the time that they were expelled from Spain and Portugal um, in the time of Queen Isabella. I remember her when, um, um, uh, Christopher Columbus was starting to sail for America. Isabella was expelling Jews and Muslims um, uh, from uh, from Spain and uh, her husband Ferdinand from Portugal. So um, uh, Sultan uh, Bezuddin at the time um, was able to settle those Jews in Bosnia Herzegovina and Muslims in Bosnia Herzegovina. And so these these acts of investment in Bosnia. Um, uh, really endeared the Bosnians to embrace Islam. And Bosnians have always had a tremendous intellectual and philosophical curiosity. So when they started understanding the social benefits of Islam, um, it became very clear to them that this was a religion to convert to. I'll give you two examples to remember this by. The Romans ruled Bosnia and Herzegovina for 450 years. Do you know how much of the Roman language Bosnians embrace? They're like less than a half a dozen words, three words that we know that came out of the Roman language in Bosnia. You know how many words came out of the Turkish language that the Bosnians embraced? The faith of the Turks, the culture of the Turks, the, um, the Ottoman era um, dresses and clothes, um, 
so much of that culture, right? And, and, and they were both ruling for about the same period of time. So when you think about, about how Bosnia and Herzegovina um, embraced the Romans, it didn't. How they embraced the Turks, well, you can go and look at the culture today and you'll have a very good idea of that. Subsequent to that, the Austro-Hungarians came um, as part of the Treaty of Berlin and they started um, also replicating the idea of investment, which is why you see the tramway in Saudi Arabia, so much infrastructure being built in the country. Um, and Bosnia was beginning to prosper under Austro-Hungarian rule until um, the Black Hand Society, a secret society in Serbia, decided that they wanted to cause disruption and they sent um, Gabriel Princip to Sarajevo, to, uh, who was a Sarajevo resident, but to assassinate um, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the streets of Sarajevo, and that spawned what we today call the First World War. So the idea of disruption has been a strategy of Serbia. Today we see the Prime Minister of Serbia on January 9th going into uh, IRS in Bosnia and Herzegovina, sowing the seeds of disruption yet again. The tactic hasn't changed. So um, uh, your 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 point about Islam, um, Bosnians love the fact that it was a, a, a religion of peace. There is a saying of Kulin Ban um, before uh, Islam came to Bosnia, which is there are four seasons, winter, spring, summer, um, and fall. Not one of them is the season of war. Kulin Ban had a message of peace, the Innocent the third, um, all of those wars have been brought on by people from outside of Bosnia and Herzegovina, sadly. So with that, I say thank you so much to all of you for being so attentive and tolerating my rants. Um, I wish you all the best and stay safe, please. Thank you.